Good morning. I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I want to welcome you to The Vine, our online campus here. And today we're continuing with our sermon series on the letters from the New Testament. In fact, today's letter is from one of Jesus' best friends. I'm talking about Peter. And Peter tells us how to be a better disciple. So I hope that you will experience God in this hour and that we might all learn something together about how we can get closer to Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, I pray that you will be with us today. That we will feel your spirit move among us, wherever we may be. Lord, reach into our hearts and touch our very souls. Lord, transform us, reshape us, Mold us into the people that you've called us to be, followers of your Son, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I am Gwen Hawley, and I attend the 1115 service. Life is constantly changing, and for me, it has been peaks and valleys, but the one constant is my faith in Jesus Christ. As I look back on my life, my prayers have always been answered. Many of them not the way I wanted them to be answered or not in the timeline I thought they should have been answered. But I can say looking back that I am so thankful that God did not do, it, do what I wanted, but what He wanted. We can only see the here and now, but He sees our whole life and His plan is perfect, even when we cannot see it. Isaiah 46.10 gives me comfort knowing that he knows the end from the beginning. For my husband John and I, 2022 was a year where everything just fell into place. And we were living on the peak of life. We had life mapped out the way we thought it should go for two people in their mid-60s. We closed the year out with family and friends celebrating the holidays at our horse farm and then started making plans for all our farm projects and the trips we wanted to take in 2023. Over the holiday season, my husband started having a nagging cough that just would not go away. He had several visits to the doctor and everyone assured us that it was nothing of concern. John told them that he had smoked when he was a young man, but had not smoked in over 35 years. The doctors again were not concerned, but they decided that a CAT scan was needed to figure out the cause. On February the 5th, 23, John went to Raleigh for a CAT scan and returned home the next day. I was not the least bit concerned, so I stayed home. He went alone. When he arrived back home, what he shared with me was not what I was expecting. For me, it was a blink. It was a second. Our world changed forever. He was told that he had a mass in his lower left lung. With the help from a family friend who is a patient navigator at UNC Rex Cancer Center in Raleigh, we immediately went to meet with a surgeon. In that meeting, we were told that John had stage four metastatic lung cancer that had spread to his lower spine, lymph nodes, and that surgery was not an option. After the initial shock, my mind and my heart both said to me, God's got this. On my, one of my favorite authors and ministers is the late Charles Stanley. He has taught me that there are many promises from God, and one of them that has helped me through my life is when you fight your battles on your knees, you will win every time. 
Through my life, God has sent me to my knees many times, but I've always felt that He was asking something of me, and often it was outside of my level of comfort. It was time of testing my faith and trusting in Him. We learn in the Bible that God wants us to become more like Him in our faith walk. Psalm 3, 5, 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will make your path straight. This Bible verse has been one that has always been there for me no matter what, and one that I have shared with others when they needed comfort and assurance. I was raised in a Christian family. I went to Bible school, youth camp, every summer. I was baptized at the age of 12, and my Christian walk was a priority until my early 30s when I placed God on the back burner. He stayed there longer than I want to admit, and after a lot of ups and downs because I was doing it my way, I realized that life was not what I wanted it to be and not what God wanted it to be. So with a heartfelt nudge from God, I started searching for the right church here in Wilmington. At that time in my life, I lived on Wrightsville Beach and had passed by Wrightsville United Methodist daily. So it was the logical place for me to start, and I immediately felt God's presence. He spoke to my heart, and He said, This is where I need you to grow in your Christ-like walk. After being a weekly visitor for several months, I became a member in 1998. I immediately wanted to be an active member of our church family, so I learned how to be involved, and there has been no turning back. God's requirement of us to share our talent, our time, and our tithe is our way of serving Him. He requires us to serve in some capacity, but I have found that we are the ones that are rewarded. The support that I have been given through the years and the friendships that I have built and nurtured at Rights for United are like no other. These past few months, my husband and I both have felt much love, support in his fight against lung cancer. The outpouring of phone calls, notes, cards, and text messages have meant so much to both of us. The caring conversations, the offer to drive him back and forth for treatment, and even to help do chores at the farm are remarkable. Our church talks the talk, and you walk the walk. Members of this church that have battled other life challenges have reached out and given us both sound advice, love, and support in so many ways. The prayer lists, the prayers that everyone has offered have made a difference. We can report that John's tumor has shrunk more than half the original size and his oncologist is very optimistic at how well he's doing. The power of prayer does work. He is living proof. I would like to close with a quote from minister and best-selling author Max Lucado. From his book, Unshakable Hope, we are building our lives on the promises of God because His Word is unbreakable, our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain of life. We stand on the great and precious promises of God. Thank you. This is a light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let the devil blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let the devil blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let the devil blow it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This is the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Hello, I'm Eun Soo Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is a great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Loving God, what a blessing it is to come together in this community of faith. We travel here from all walks of life, spanning different ages and stages, and we are welcomed in your love and your presence. We are truly grateful for this. Holy God, it is a privilege and an honor to be chosen by you. We pray that you will continue to guide us in walking in the grace that is already bestowed upon us. With your help, we will forever remain in your marvelous light as light will always overcome darkness. We will not go back to our past. So help us to grow, move forward, and radiate your light into the world. Lord, we are thankful for your blessings in our life. We bring to you the situations of celebration. It reminds us of the goodness that there is in our life. Breathe your spirit into this wonderful event that all who gather may rejoice and celebrate the blessings you have given each of us. Also, we pray for those who are struggling with loss, with illness, with depression, with addiction, with isolation from those that they love. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our heart. Be with each of them. Lay your hand of healing gently over their lives and pour out your balm of peace on them. Help us to be of service to each other in your holy name. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have time to offer our hearts and gifts, I'd like to remind you that you can give the ministry of the Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website, our smartphone apps, and via mail. Let us continue to worship God. I'm Pastor Eun Soo. I'm so happy to have this time with you. So today, I thought we would build something. So I brought these blocks. So let's see if we can build a tower. So I'm going to start this white one and then a red one. And then orange one. And then green one. And the last one is yellow. I did it! See, we have a nice and colorful tower. And this block here, the white block, is what we call the cornerstone. This cornerstone block holds all the other blocks up. So what do you think would happen to this tower if I pulled this cornerstone block out, yeah, it would fall down. And 
I'm curious if it really happens. So just let's do it. Three, two, one. Oh no! Yeah, our tower sure went down, didn't it? It can't stand if I pull out this cornerstone. Now, what if this tower means our faith? And what do you think the cornerstone of our faith is? Yes, Jesus. The cornerstone of our faith is Jesus. So I have this block named Jesus. In the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, Just like we use a cornerstone to start building a tower, God gives us a cornerstone, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is like the most important block that holds all together in our faith. And Jesus teaches us how to love and how to care one another. So based on Jesus, According to his teaching, we can grow with goodness. And we can grow with gentleness. And we can grow with joy. And we can grow with love. So beloved Riceville kids, let us remember if we lose Jesus, we lose our faith. It all falls apart. But we know that we will not lose Jesus because he promised to be always be with us. And he helps us to grow in faith. So let's thank him for that. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for being with us all the time. We know that you are the cornerstone of our faith. So keep us aware of how important you are to all of us and help us grow in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning of our time today, our letter that we're exploring is 1 Peter. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, if you'd like to follow along. Peter says, Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious." But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, once we were no people, but you have chosen us, and now we are your people. Lord, help us to live as a people of grace and mercy and love and holiness and goodness and all of the many ways that Christ acted in this world. We 
ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the first sermon I ever preached in a church was on Matthew 28, the Great Commission, at Chestnut Ridge United Methodist Church in Eflin, North Carolina. I was working at the time at Camp Chestnut Ridge that was located just beside the little church. The second sermon I ever preached was just a few weeks later at a church in Mebane, and it was on today's text from Peter. I do still have a copy of that sermon, but I promise I'm not going to preach it to you today. However, you want to hear something odd? Years later, I mean like 20 years later, I ran into a woman from that church in Mebane where I preached my second sermon ever, and she still had the bulletin from that day. I couldn't believe it. It, it, it was so cool and so weird. I, I didn't know her back when I first preached that sermon, but for some reason, she kept that bulletin. Well, being kind of cool and weird kind of matches up with what St. Peter says today about the early Christians. He called them a peculiar people. Now, the dictionary definition of peculiar says out of the ordinary, strange, odd, unusual. You might say just plain weird. Of course, odd or out of the ordinary all depends on what you consider normal. In Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo were amazed to discover that their traveling companions had never heard of second breakfast. And in the world of Hogwarts, what's odd for muggles is perfectly normal for Harry Potter. But the dictionary also offers a more positive spin on the, world peculiar, on the word peculiar. It can also mean special, particular, distinctive, belonging to one thing and not another. And I think that that's the definition Peter has in mind when he says that Christians are a peculiar people. Let's look at the, some of the connecting images Peter uses to define that early Christian church. In addition to calling us a peculiar people, he also calls us a royal priesthood, a holy nation with a particular task. By digging into these phrases, we might understand better who we're supposed to be today as a church as well. First of all, we are a holy nation. Well, right off the bat, it's obvious Peter's not talking about political citizenship in the nation or state. He's not advocating for the divine right of kings or for manifest destiny. Nor is he suggesting that one political nation or state is somehow more holy than another. He is, after all, writing in the day when the Roman Empire was in full force, literally covering and controlling all the known world. The worship of Caesar and the state was part of the woodwork, the full melding of religion and state. The creed of the nation was Caesar is Lord. They really believed that the nation was holy and that Caesar was divine. Peter is not talking about that kind of national allegiance or citizenship at all. Rather, Peter's writing to this fledgling band of scattered disciples who in the face of the might of Rome and the worship of Caesar are bold enough to declare Jesus is Lord. These are the ones he's calling a holy nation called out from every other nation and every tribe and every language by God, marked by the sign of the cross, traveling under the banner of allegiance to Christ as Lord of all. You, says Peter, because you belong to one thing and not another. Because you belong to Jesus rather than to Caesar. Because you worship God alone and not the state. Because your first allegiance is to the cross, rather to any standard sign or flag. Therefore, you are a holy nation, God's own people. Now, the problem of misunderstanding what it means to be a holy nation goes all the way back to the beginning, with God's original call to the children of Abraham, the people of Old Testament Israel. You see, early on in Hebrew history, the people were beginning to think that they were kind of special. We can start to believe it's all about our goodness and our identity and who we are that makes all the difference. So as early as the book of Deuteronomy, Moses used the very same language and image which Peter now claims for the Christians. He says, for you as a people, excuse me, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. He said, the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession 
Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more numerous that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you. Not because you're so special, but because God is special and God loves you. Not that you're so holy, but because God is holy and has redeemed you. Not that there's something intrinsically better about your state than any other, but because God has claimed you and made you his own. You, as the people of God, from every nation and every language, you are a holy nation, God's own people. Peter Story, the former bishop of the Methodist Church of South Africa, and one of my professors at Duke Divinity School, led the South African Methodists through the difficult and challenging days of their witness against the evils of apartheid. In a sermon that he wrote back in 1989 before the liberation of his nation, Bishop Story said, In South Africa, the pagan notion of racial purity and pride has become that nation's God and that sick, false religion stains everything we do. One of the great tragedies of my homeland is that some parts of the Christian church have become mouthpieces, not of God, but of the state. It's time for the church to be the church. You see, Jesus brought into being an entirely new, radical, different community, offering people citizenship that transcends the frontiers of nations and contrasts powerfully with all the norms around it. This alternative identity must be cherished as the most important characteristic of the church, that our identity is in Jesus Christ. I think Bishop Story's right. The church needs to be clear about who we are and who we're not. Our highest allegiance is always to Christ. We belong to one thing and not another. We are gathered from all the peoples of the earth as the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, a holy nation. It makes us a bit peculiar, distinctive, special, particular. We are God's own people. And secondly, we are a royal priesthood. Now that word royal might get you to thinking of the priesthood as some order of princes of the church, elevated, holy, robed in silver, gilded with gold, better than everybody else. Nothing could be further from the truth in the mind of Peter or the pattern of Christ. You see, to be a priest is to be one who goes between God and the people. It's to be one who communicates the word of God to the world. It's to be commissioned with the task of carrying the ministry of Christ out into the community. To be the ones who break the bread of reconciliation and bear the cup of Christ's mercy to those who are hurting and in need. And Peter's letter is not addressed to some sort of set-apart class of ordained clergy. None actually existed in the church at the time of 1 Peter I happen to believe in the role of the ordained. I've spent 27 years of my life doing this, but Peter's letter is addressed to the whole church. You are a royal priesthood. All are called to go between God and the world. All are called to carry the love of Christ to others. All are called to be the servant people of God. All are called to be priests to one another. In contrast to the priests of the pagan temples around them, who were venerated, pampered, and out of touch with the common people, Peter calls the whole church to the task of servanthood, to the calling of Christ. Several years ago, when British Airways was doing well, Dick Georgiatis was credited for turning British Airways into the most profitable airline in the entire world. When asked about the secret of his success, Dick said, Oh, it's really quite simple. We just turned our entire management philosophy upside down and everyone became accountable to the person below them rather than the person above them. So here's this massive corporation embracing the servant lifestyle of Jesus. The focus of the company would be on the humble passenger rather than the top executive. So who's the focus of the church? Who's the person we're concerned about? 
Who do we exist to serve? For Jesus, there's no question. In the kingdom, the humble are lifted up. The most vulnerable have a special place. Jesus says the final judgment will be on what we've done for the least of these. We are called to be a royal priesthood in service to the world. Yes, indeed. We are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And third, we have a particular task. To declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that phrase. You got to have to take a deep breath to say it all. There are no commas, no semicolons. It's to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What a commission. What a calling. What a task. Just imagine what it would be like to start every morning looking in the mirror, saying to yourself that no matter what work I have to do today, my first task is to declare the wonderful words of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. No matter how boring the meetings you attend or how dull the duties you have, my hidden agenda today is going to be to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. No matter how depressing the headlines are or how dark the future seems, my calling today is to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When John Wesley sent lay preacher George Shadford to the American colonies with nothing in his saddlebag but his Bible and his hymnal, he sent him with this commission. He said, I set you loose, George, on the great continent of America. Proclaim your message in the open face of the sun and do all the good you can. Those early circuit riders were given a charge to proclaim scriptural holiness and to reform the continent. And they went about doing just that. They were peculiar, special, distinctive, commissioned with the task of proclaiming the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. One quick story that I think kind of sums it up, at least for me. Some of you may recall that in the winter of 2019, I went with our former associate pastor, Edie Gleaves, to the country of Sierra Leone to celebrate the work our church has been doing at the hospital there in the town of Rotofunk. Sierra Leone is in the bottom 10 of countries around the world for average life expectancy. It is next to last in per capita income, and it's absolutely last when it comes to the infant mortality rate or the number of babies who do not survive to see their first birthday. Visiting there is eye-opening and intense. Thousands upon thousands of people live in homes with tin roofs and dirt floors with no running water or electricity. It is tough, really tough by any American standard. But the United Methodist Church is actually very strong there. The church has started dozens of schools in several hospitals, including the one in Rotofunk. They've started an initiative to teach people how to improve farming techniques. The United Women of Faith built a bakery this past spring that will employ women and help them become self-reliant. At the bakery, the women have been trained in management skills, in bookkeeping, in marketing, in customer service, and more. The church has started a prison ministry that works with youth in juvenile detention to help transform their lives and give them a future with hope. It's amazing to see the impact of the United Methodist Church on this small but struggling part of West Africa. So I'm there in 2019 with Edie, and our friend and church member Dale Smith flies over later to meet us there. And we're to be guests of the bishop at the United Methodist Church's annual conference in Sierra Leone. But let me tell you how their conference starts. Hundreds upon hundreds of Methodists come to the capital of Freetown from all over the country. Just like our annual conference delegates meet each year in Greenville. But in Sierra Leone, they block off the main street and have a parade from the conference headquarters to the church that's hosting the annual conference. The distance is probably, I don't know, a mile and a half maybe. Everyone dresses up in their finest clothes 
and they sing and dance as drummers and brass players lead a procession throughout the very busy city of Freetown. It is such a celebration. There in the midst of all of this poverty and pain, in the midst of so much darkness and death, there is this group of people who march through the streets declaring the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Odd, strange, certainly out of the ordinary, special, distinctive, very particular, belonging to one thing and not another. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own people, a peculiar people that we call Christians. That's who we are. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for calling us out of the darkness and into your light. Lord, help us with our task. Send your Spirit to give us the right words to say and at times the right time to just sit and listen so that we might declare the marvelous deeds that you have done that have brought us out of darkness and into your light. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter says we've got a task to proclaim the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I want you to remember that. Let's break it down. There are three different clauses. To proclaim the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. One more time. To proclaim the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What are we doing today? We're proclaiming the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Wouldn't it be great if others could say the same thing? Right? Proclaim the wonderful deeds of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Go forth to do just that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.